is uh, Dr. Prisan Palm. Uh, you should be relieved that we have an accountancy expert in our midst, uh, because that is, uh, it's always useful to have a good accountant on your side. And in politics, the whole subject of accountancy um, and the literacy in matters of superannuation and accounting um, are politically important. And that is Prisan Palm's uh, doctoral thesis uh, awarded uh, last year. She is currently uh, at, in the business school at the Queensland University of Technology. Uh, Chris, a warm welcome to you wherever you are. There you are. Uh,
in Chinese soil that we can openly commemorate this incident. And the history needs to be told, and the history needs to be passed on to future generations. And, um, and hopefully one day, not long later, um, we can predict, can, um, we can predict um, this incident. Um, okay, the Hong Kong in recent years. Um, some of the speaker, previous speakers have alluded to a lot of the issues that we have been fighting with. Um, and I guess, since I've, I've actually come, um, lived in um, Australia since 1994, as first day as a student, and I migrated here in 2001. Um, but on and off, I have returned to Hong Kong at work and, and visited most of my family as I still there. And seeing the kind of um, everyday struggle between, um, I mean, people in Hong Kong, we talk about some of the uh, conflicts with mainlanders. I, I don't think, uh, from a personal point of view, I don't think this is, um, we are not discriminating the mainlanders. Rather, it's um, our living space, our everyday life are uh, impacted upon. A typical example is, a example is um, like small shops, um, bakery shop, noodle shop. We, we, we see them disappearing in droves because they cannot afford the um, skyrocketed rent because all the rent has been, um, all the shops uh, have been pushed out to, to make room for jewellery shop, for pharmacies so that they are to, to cater to the demand of uh, mainlander for from the milk um, and that kind of thing. And, and so Hong Kong people found that we, our, our traditional way of life um, is an increasingly placed in a, a challenging um, place. And um, media ownership, media uh, representation. Um, more and more we can see self-censorship with the media, the main me mainstream media, and even um, uh, the social media. So um, the, the traditional way of um, the core values that Hong Kong people value, um, we can see that it's increasingly being dis um, eroded by, by the mainland government. Um, now, the Hong Kong in recent months, and this is for people who have gone through um, the umbrella movement, this probably brought on a lot of um, uh, memories. And, I wasn't in Hong Kong then, but I um, was actually at my very last revision of my PhD, and I found myself couldn't focus on my PhD. My, my eyes, my heart were in Hong Kong as the scene unfolded when the tea gas was fired. And, um, um, and seeing the Occupy movement, uh, Occupy Central movement becoming occupied at Moti, Mong Kok, and Cosway Bay. At, um, and also, I guess, um, I. I Luckily, I did find a chance to go back to Hong Kong just in the dying days of the movement and being able to, to live um, uh, rather than living vicariously through, through the, the picture. Um, someone I, I, met, I uh, ran into at the uh, afternoon morning tea this morning has described that the sense of the street during the umbrella movement um, presents itself to me like a utopia. Um, it's a sense of community. Um, people on the streets were looking after each other. Um, there were people donating food, donating um, medical equipment, and donating their time. And this is to fight for a better Hong Kong. It's not for their own gain, it's for the betterment of the society. And I really felt, um, I was so proud of my, my fellow Hong Kongers who for 79 days, persisted on the street. And it's such a peaceful atmosphere, unlike what the mainstream media may portray it to be. There, of course, there were pockets of conflict, but in, in most of the cases, it, it was a very peaceful demonstration. There was not even one shop window was broken. And I took my head off. I thought everyone in Hong Kong who participated in this movement should deserve a, a peace prize. Because anywhere else in the world, if you have tens of thousands of people on the street, it will become a riot easily. But that wasn't the case in Hong Kong. Um, so that was the Hong Kong in recent months. Um, 
And then, so last year, I actually went back to Hong Kong four, four times. <laughs> um, and in December, I went again, and of course, the zones were clear. There were no more tents on the streets. It seemed to return to normal. But behind the scene, I think the, the discontent of the situation is it, still mounting. And I want to finish this point about what the Hong Kong may become in future years or, or decades. If, um, if the law get passed of, I mean, the proposal, the proposal, the constitutional reform package that will be coming up to sort of parliament in Hong Kong in, uh, in a couple of weeks, um, if we accept a fake democracy um, and to give the government sort of the, the fake endorsement, um, then I, I am very concerned that um, the sort of um, uh, divisiveness of the society could not be mended. And um, I don't want that Hong Kong to be the future for, for the Hong Kong in the years to come. Um, I want to get on to my next sort of implications, which is probably the main topic for today. Why people in Australia, and indeed the, the wider world, should care about what happened in Hong Kong? I mean, what is the relevance for them? Um, I try to put it as a, a China issue. Um, I mean, the, the broken promise that a lot of previous speakers have mentioned about the, um, the Sino-British um, Declaration signed in 1984. And it was a, a solemn declaration for Hong Kong people to give Hong Kong a one country, two systems framework of government. government. And um, it's for a period of 50 years from 1997. And I, I remember hearing an interview um, that she at, at, uh, with uh, Martin, Ms. Martin Lee, the democracy father of Hong Kong, he, who was heavily involved with the drafting of the basic law. And his recollection of why there was a 50 years promise was that not that in year 2047 it will revert back to the communist way. Rather, uh, Mr. Deng Xiaoping's idea of giving 50 years promise for Hong Kong is so that China can catch up in that 50 years. Um, so that um, so that's a picture, I guess, the original um, idea for this architect of one country, two system. Yet, this is only year 18 since 1997, and we could see this promise pretty much get broken with the um, white paper last year and a lot of new proposal, different way to interpret the, the basic law. Um, so this broken promise, it, it has implications for the wider world because um, if China can so easily walk away from this declaration, can anyone, I mean, what can the other country, can we ponder, like now with China being so powerful, with all these international community, uh, commitments that they have, can you still have trust that China will honor any commitments that they, they're making? So this is a big question mark, and I guess Hong Kong people really need to make this point quite in our everyday conversations with local Australian, with with people of the Western world. I guess um, yeah, this is a real issue affecting everyone, not just Hong Kong people. And um, the red capital probably um, had to mention that, and we're seeing that in in Australia where. Um, Australia, um, sorry, Chinese mainland um, enterprises are buying up uh, mining companies, uh, our mineral resources, more and more are being controlled or semi-controlled by um, money with Chinese blessing. And, um, <coughs> and you can openly walk into any deal um, with their resources. And um, do Australian has any say of um, how we can protect our own um, national resources. And, um, so this is another issue. Corruption, um, I don't think I can, I, I need to tell you a lot of examples of corruption in, in China. But this sort of corrupted practices, we are seeing it inflating, um, influencing the Western world. 
And um, I guess John in Sydney University lately there has been some scandal, the um, economic, um, academics um, standards being compromises with Chinese students, mainly international students, they forged their way into the universities and even paying bright with the overseas educational agency. I guess this is happening more and more. Um, this probably in China is an acceptable way to, to do business. Um, but this wasn't the acceptable way for the Western world. We have a long held, I guess, uh, governance, transparency, a, a pretty um, transparent way of doing business, doing education. But with the Chinese way influencing their way into Australia and the Western world, we, we, I'm concerned that this type of corrupted practices, uh, we have to bend our room to, to welcome Chinese capital, Chinese way of deal, dealing. And this is a concerning um, trend. Soft power, we mentioned about some media ownership issue. And um, I read, and this probably has happened in other, um, in Canada, in other Chinese community, in other countries, is that um, some Chinese community-based community newspaper radio stations, they, are, uh, they have been sort of harmonized by Chinese um, money so that um, they would not be comfortable <coughs> reporting things that the, the CCP would not be happy with. So if you are a Hong Kong or Chinese mainlander living in Australia, you pick up any Chinese paper, I mean paper, local paper in Chinese language, you won't get a full picture of what's going on in China, in Hong Kong. And um, soft power, in terms of uh, the Confucius Institute, anyone heard of that? Um, yeah? In Australia, Canada, yeah. Um, indeed, some people probably didn't realize, and they thought, well, we we're only wanting to learn Mandarin. And it's, um, it's very, they offer a very popular language course, but behind the scene, that's the kind of yeah, brainwashing to get people to be comfortable with communist uh, doctrine. And um, so this is something to, to, to look out for. I have a question mark about a level playing field. Um, and I talked, I guess, as an academic, accounting academic, so I chew our uh, graduates who who hopefully will get jobs in Hong Kong and in, in other countries. Um, I said to them, you need to be aware that the Hong Kong that years ago where if you have a qualification, you work hard, you probably get a decent job and you can climb up, climb up the, um, the ladder. But more and more I heard a story about now it is not a level playing field in the business world. You have to have Guan Xi. So relationship with people with um, relationship with the mainland or people of influence to get into uh, acceptable, I guess, a, a position. So this is the sort of thing we're facing um, in in, in increasingly corrupted um, world um, dominated by Chinese power. So this sort of paint a pretty grim picture. So I wanted to finish with some action. What can we do um, in the face of this kind of thing? Well, keep watch. Um, keep an eye out of what's happening in Hong Kong, um, particularly in the next coming weeks. So um, as the uh, political reform package will be come up to the Legislative Council um, and, and the ongoing struggle with, um, of, of Hong Kong. Um, I said to some of my colleagues in, in Australia, if we can lobby the government, or if we see any politicians here, local or otherwise, talk to them and I guess, I don't know whether this is a naive thought, if we can lobby them to take a stand, um, make our voice heard about Hong Kong, and I guess also form some network. Um, so this struggle in Hong Kong, similar as to the struggle of people in Taiwan, people in, um, in Tibet, um, if we can on cow, if we can form some sort of alliance because we are facing a common enemy, 
and if we found together, uh, hopefully there would be better chance for um, a solidarity in its power. Um, and the last point, beware the great firework of China, and this linked very well, I guess, with Stephanie, you mentioned about the internet security. I guess people in China, maybe they know, they know that they live within the firewall of, of um, internet censorship. And so for mainland students in Australia, when we get the chance to speak to them, I said to them, well, use this chance when you have unlimited access to free information in Australia, uncensored information. Try to understand like, what happened in 1989 and um, all the, all the, all the um, uh, Falun Gong issue or live organ tray or things like that that are totally wiped out if you live in China. You thought you live in a perfect world. And um, so I guess if we can use forums such as this and, and speak to people um, on a daily, uh, everyday conversation, um, hopefully we can, we can um, and a better chance of, of uh, fighting our common enemy. And I want to finish off with saying, um, oh, what did I want to say? Yes, that's right. What the Hong Kong I want, want to be. I have two young boys. They are turning four and seven next week. Um, and I, I um, am my recently separated husband. He is very against me doing this sort of thing. I am, he thinks that I am wasting my time wasting my time and because we are facing um, a big party machine, what chance do we have to, to fight this big party machine? Um, and I said to him, despite his disapproval, I said, as a Hong Konger, I cannot stand idly to see Hong Kong decay. I don't want Hong Kong to become just another corrupted mainland city. And this is what pushed me or drive me um, into doing little things that I can do as a Hong Kong in Australia. And I want my boys, if one day they were to live in Hong Kong, I want them to enjoy living in a free and fair Hong Kong, that kind of society that I grew up in. So thank you very much. So, um, there's actually a joke in Egypt about Hong Kong, um, and it, it happened during the um, Andalusian uh, movement. And so, um, the joke goes like this: uh, basically, because during the Tahrir, the 18 days of the uprising, what happened was that um, when you know everyone was cleaning the streets and cooperating in the civic pocket, and then the army came in. And so, when the Hong Kong uh, protesters were cleaning up the uh, streets, everyone from each was sarcastically posting, uh, sending messages saying, "Don't do what you're doing, sir. Don't clean the streets up." Because then the army would come in, etc. Um, so um, yeah, and so the thing is, um, I can see there's a lot of um, melancholy and pessimism about what's happening. Uh, but let me just try and give it from the perspective of the Arab Spring, um, looking at Hong Kong. Um, it does invigorate hope. It's a, it's a two-way process. Uh, so when, when uh, protesters in Egypt, um, there is a, uh, a, a security crackdown and repressive. Uh, authoritarian resurgence that's happening. But when they do see incidents of toxin to Hong Kong, then they reinvigorate. They start really um, thinking, okay, maybe you know this thing is not lining up. You know, we're still influencing because they still take credit obviously from uh, the Tunisia when we started. But um, and so it's um, it, it, it creates new strategies and new tactics of, um, of how to do things again because it's a, they're seeing it as a part of global movements. Um, and so and even if Hong Kong dies down, something else arises that will reinvigorate Hong Kong. So I think there's a lot of questions that we have to start asking uh, beyond the uh, East Asia the area as well. Yes. Hi, I'm Katrina. I'm studying in University of Sydney. And actually, I just want to ask, uh, because when we have some conversation with the mainland China students, and maybe we're just promoting for the 
that interest to look at about the event of the June book. But some of them have just maybe said, oh, I'm not interested in that. Or some of them is just like say, oh, that's a fake event and it's just something the Westerners make it up. So what can we do as we know the event, that how to promote and let them to know more? And yeah, what can we do? Well, I guess, um, yeah, I had similar experience with you. I've run into mainland students on my campuses, and a lot of them, yeah, give me exact sort of response. They're not interested, or they, yeah. Um, I guess just persist in talking to them. I mean, not as a, as a lecture way, I guess I am a lecturer, but in everyday conversation, I try not to. Um, it's a friendly way. But, and I guess um, you can point them to some websites with useful information. This is not fabricated story. Um, um, the paper clips, the newspaper articles that, um, that, that shows that this is history, this happened. Last. Okay. I just uh, a comment on that day of course. In support of your, your observation, yeah. I'm from Meta. Um, you might be aware of the very strong right protection movement, which are known in China. Uh, I just want to uh, let you know that millions and millions of Chinese citizens are fighting against this every day, in every way. So it's, it's, when you encounter those difficulties of talking to students here, but you need to know one thing in the fact for those mainland students coming from China to study in the British University in Rice City, they are either coming from government officials family or very rich cities. <laughs> they have very natural connections to the city itself. So they are not necessarily the identity of the Chinese population. Yeah, I guess yeah, they are the self-interested group. Self-interest group. Those who can afford to come to Australia to study, they have a self-interest not to know too much or not to, to uphold the status quo of the CCP's power. So it's extra difficult to get. Allow me two minutes. Um, it's an advertisement. Um, sorry. I do have some booklet about the umbrella movement. Free. This is free um, for anyone. I have some brought, brought some copies from Brisbane, um, from Hong Kong originally. Collections of articles about the movement. Then I had a book called Sanjo by Yang Garland, a famous journalist. I bought 50 copies of this book, thanks to Ash, who helped me early on, a couple of months ago. Um, all signed by the author, and this is $20 each. And the proceeds go to support a scholarship for um, journalist students at um, the Baptist University in Hong Kong. So I have about 15 copies that I brought from, from Brisbane yesterday. And this is the last thing. This is a, um, someone mentioned oh, about Joshua Wong. This is a DVD documentary about called Lessons in Descent. And this is a deep documentary about the anti-national um, education movement a couple of years ago. Um, two DVDs with a booklet. Um, I was honored to be invited to write a little piece there. So I have about five um, of this DVD pack. It's $30 each. So I don't want to bring the, bring them all back to Brisbane. So if you're happy, please see them. Thank you. Thank you very much.